Today we are going to discuss uh, fetuses or women presenting with fundus less than dates. Their common question is, Doctor, is my baby small? This is one of the commonest problems which we encounter in antenatal clinics. So we will see what we can do about it. If the baby is small, your differential diagnosis should start from uh, wrong dates. Or oh, is it abnormal fetus? No, is the baby dead already, uh, in triotrine death? Or oh, is the baby small for dates? Or oh, small for gestational age? Or oh, is the baby growth restricted? Is there any problem with lyco? Is it losing? Is the woman leaking lyco? Is there a malpresentation or malposition of the fetus? These are the differential diagnoses which you need to consider before committing only to small for dates or growth restriction. One of your first question is, is this baby really small? How can I confirm it? What are the causes for small fetus? And how can we monitor a small baby inside the mother's womb and can I do anything to improve its well-being or growth and when should we really deliver them and what are the long-term effects of a uh, long-term uh, effects of a small baby in uh, its uh, adult life and what should we do to look after immediately after birth of a small baby. Right, we'll start answering these questions one by one. Is this baby really small? Now growth is defined in various ways. Now, one of the commonest uh, definitions is growth is an expression of genetic potential to grow in a way that is neither constrained nor promoted by internal or external factors. That is called the normal fetal growth. But you can see that it is a very practically unusable or a definition. It's, its utility in treating or managing a frequency is almost zero because nobody can really clearly point out the genetic potential of a fetus who is in the mother's womb. True, we can guess with the mother's size, father's size and other factors like nutrition, poor social condition that the baby may be large or small but still that is not a good uh, way of assessing somebody's growth or defining growth. Then. We need to learn a little bit about intrauterine growth. It is generally following a 16-week rule. In the first six, 16 weeks, all cell divisions are uniform. And in the second 16 weeks, there's uh, cell division plus growth. And in the third 16 weeks, it's mainly the growth of the cells. So initially, normal cell will increase in size called the hypertrophy and then it will increase in number which is called the hyperplasia. So generally the growth is related to the gestational age of the fetus. If born preterm the birth weight is obviously small and birth weight is only objective parameter which is observable at birth which can indicate how well a baby has been growing in the womb. With ultrasound biometry, we can estimate or calculate intrauterine weights as well by using various formula. Whereas at birth, since we can have a concrete measurement, we categorize by the fetuses who are born by birth weight into lower birth weight very low birth weight and extremely low birth weight being less than 2500, less than 1500 or less than 1000 grams at birth. 
and this classification ignores gestational age it doesn't uh, care about what the gestational age of the baby is so it's a classification which is uh, which takes into, into account only the weight no gestation uh, baby born by uh, low birth rates so can be preterm maybe a small baby constitutionally small that means the whole family has been delivering small babies so this baby is also small or it may be small because of the restriction of its growth so we can plot the birth weight and gestational age and then put the weights of the babies against their gestational age suppose at 37 weeks somebody's weight falls at 2500 then it is in the range between lower 10th centile or upper 90th centile so this is an appropriate size baby but if at the same POA if the baby's weight is less, around 2000 grams this baby is small it will falls below the 10th centile so we can classify a birth birth date of a baby and then plot it against the gestational age and then for a given population we can identify babies who are large appropriate or small for gestational age or the gestational dates we know that the birth rate has another significance if the birth rate is poor or low perinatal mortality is so generally a baby is taken as small for gestational age when it is estimated fetal weight to abdominal circumference which are the two parameters which are very sensitive to growth or restriction is less than the 10th centile for that population if it is less than third centile, it is called severe gestation, a small for gestational age. But being small doesn't always mean that they are growth restricted. Majority of the babies who fall below 10th centile are actually constitutionally small. So we need to clear in our mind that growth restriction or fetal growth restriction is not synonymous or equal to small for gestational age about 50 to 70 percent of the small for gestational age babies are actually constitutionally small and they have fetal growth appropriate for maternal size and ethnicity so your ethnicity your mother's size plays a big part in influencing your growth The, the rest of the small for gestational age, about 30%, 50 to 30%, may be growth restricted. And the amount of uh, babies who are growth restricted actually increases when you have CVSG or birth weight less than third centile. So when babies fall into that level, majority of them are really growth restricted fetuses when we take growth restriction it implies a pathological restriction not the normal growth potential and these pathologically small babies can be identified with abnormal Doppler studies reduced lyco volume abnormal CTGs and abnormal uh, uh, biophysical profiles as abnormal because their bodily functions are affected. This shows up the same information in different ways. So if you take the total set of all small for gestational age babies, only a small subsection will be 
or subset will be growth restricted or FGR babies. The other ones are normal small babies, so constitutionally small babies. So what are the causes for small fetus? Common factors which affect our birth weight or size are race, mother size, female baby, nulliparity, because second or third babies are generally larger than the first baby. Previous history of low birth weight baby, maternal tendency to have, from the maternal side, the tendency to have small babies. All these factors, maternal, fetal, placental and uterine factors will affect the fetal growth. Other external factors uh, influencing on the mother are smoking, alcohol, drugs, usage like cocaine and amphetamines, social disadvantages, preeclampsia, chronic hypertension, especially with atherosclerosis, chronic tissue disorders like SLE and acquired or genetic thrombophilia. So all these factors affect the growth. Maternal diabetes, cardiac disorders, hypotension, respiratory diseases, severe anemias, renal diseases, treatment with anti-cancer agents and poor nutrition are all linked or indicated as causes for small babies. Then we have fetal factors which are fetal infections, torch infections, fetal malformations, chromosomal defects like Down syndrome, uh, Edward syndrome, are all linked with small babies. Placental factors including abruption, thrombosis, placentitis, choreomniatis, cyst, choreangiomas, uh, decreased uteroplacental blood flows are all linked with poor fetal growth. Then we have large submucous fibroids, uterine septa, like things as uterine factors. So we know the external factors. Now we need to confirm whether the baby who is inside is really small. So to do that, we need to first start from the beginning of the pregnancy. So in the first and second trimester, we need to start screening for a possibility of this particular baby or the fetus becoming small. As usual, it starts with the obstetric history and examination and we can couple that with some maternal screenings as well as uterine artery dopplers. In the second and third trimesters, we can couple that with abdominal palpation and measuring the symphysiofundal height chart in including usage of customized charts. So in your history, you can uh, we'll, in the next slide we will see the factors which are important. You will have major risk factors and minor risk factors. If you have a single major risk factors, that fetus should be assessed with umbilical artery doppler from about 26 weeks and onwards regularly. If you have three or more minor risk factors, at least you should do a uterine artery doppler around 20 to 24 weeks of POA. And if it becomes normal, then you can follow them at leisurely intervals uh, to identify any further deterioration. But uh, those who have major risk factors need regular follow-up. So these are the major risk factors and minor risk factors. Those which are on board are the major risk factors. Smoking, maternal age is a big risk factor. Smoking, cocaine use, CV exercises, previous stillbirth, previous SGA baby, maternal SGA, if the mother had been small at birth, chronic hypertension, diabetes and other vascular diseases, renal impairment, antiposolipid syndromes, fathers becoming small for gestational age. They are all risk factors, major risk factors for small for me. In the current pregnancy, if they have been having heavy bleeding, similar to menses, or cogenic bowel, or preeclampsia had been detected, severe pregnancy-induced hypertension, unexplained antipartum hemorrhages, poor maternal weight gain, or when you screen for Down syndrome, if your pap A in the first trimester, 
pregnancy associated placental protein A is low, less than 0.4 multiples of median. That is a risk, major risk factor for uh, growth restriction. So this slide summarizes what you need to do. Minor risk factors, three or more. Major risk factors, one risk factor. You probably need to consider giving aspirin under 16 weeks. It can be started even at 9-10 weeks and onwards and continue till 34-36 weeks. And at reassess uh, if you have any suspicion of Down syndrome, reassess around 20 weeks. And if you have even a single risk factor, they should have uterine art umbilical artery Doppler from 26 weeks and onwards. If you have three or more minor risk factors, do a uterine artery Doppler around 20 to 24 weeks. If it is normal, then you continue with fetal size assessment and umbilical artery Doppler in third trimester. If it is abnormal, you start monitoring from then onwards, even from 20 weeks onwards, you should be starting umbilical artery Doppler assessments. And then, depending on the institutional policy, you, uh, you can re continue assessment in the third trimester regularly, especially if the woman uh, is having pregnancy-induced hypertension or antipartum hemorrhage, the baby needs regular growth assessments. I mentioned earlier that biochemical markers like pap a if you detect it accidentally, if it is low, is a good indicator of future growth restriction. So we can actually predict to a certain extent of a fetus who is going to be small in future. Uterine artery doctor has another prediction ability in high risk population, high risk patient population. Though, so if the mother or the fetus has certain risk factors, minor or major, doing this, especially minor criteria, if doing this will help us to identify those who are fetuses who are at risk. You do it around 20 to 24 weeks and if you see any notching in the uterine artery blood flow, this is the notch. This one doesn't, this one has. This is abnormal, this is normal, this is abnormal. You can identify and read. In low risk people, this is not really indicated, but if you are high risk, you can identify. And it loses its value after 20 to 24 weeks. So doing it later in pregnancy is probably not useful because it becomes normal. And repeating it an up, uh, artery drop later is of limited value. As I mentioned, if you see any abnormality, start doing umbilical artery doppler. So, if you see any fetal echogenic bowel, again, same way. And then we come to, so those are the history-based risk factors guiding our investigation, so screening later on. Then come, we come to examination. If you see abdominal fundal, uh, symphysial fundal height or abdominal palpation, you can use that to identify a source screen for possible growth restricted fetuses. And generally from about 20 weeks or 24 weeks, we can use it. And if it is done with the same examiner using a tape, its accuracy is around 50 to 60 percent. And if it is plotted on a customized chart based on on a particular population, it may have a better accuracy. So this is a customized sentinel growth chart, which is available in www.gestation.net website. It has originated in Midlands in UK. Uh, you can utilize that choosing Indian uh, population data for our calculation and generate a customized growth chart for Sri Lankan women as well. You need to choose the ethnicity as India. That 
it will give us a fairly good estimation of uh, predicted gestation uh, uh, symphysial funnel height and you can plot that and it is said that it increases there are people who can contradict that and dispute its accuracy but still RCOJ is still recommending plotting on a uh, customized chart so if you can use that and if the symphysial fundal height plotted on a customized chart falls somewhere here this is a small baby if it is here between these two lines it is normal if it is here it's abnormally large and they should have ultrasound scan for growth assessment. There are certain factors which will impact on the surface of fundal height. Obviously large babies, BM, obese mother, women with fibroids or polyhydramnios are not good candidates for fundal height measurements. Right, now we have gone through the history and examination and plotted the uh, fundal height and baby looks small. Now we need to identify whether this baby is really small or abnormally small. That means constitutionally small or abnormally small baby. So we need to find out the optimum method of diagnosing a SGA baby from a FGAR baby. Generally what we use are abdominal circumference or estimated fetal weight you calculated using various formulae which are available and plot them on a uh, growth chart. And you need to do it regularly in serial assessment and plot them on a growth chart. You can see same women you can see yes large mother tall mother has a tall large baby small mother has a small baby so various populations will have various ultrasound growth charts you can use one of them we have one for Sri Lanka uh, developed by Professor Tirandias and uh, uh, several other charts are available for international population like WHO charts and intergrowth charts all of them can be utilized Nobody really knows which is accurate. There are disputes, controversies, but still, if your unit uses one, better to stick with that. You can use them to plot the measurements of the fetal uh, biometry. And you have to follow those patients with regular every third week or so of biometry. Doing biometry more than less than two weeks uh, interval is useless. So any change in the abdominal circumference or estimated fetal weight detected on fetal biometry can help us to identify fetal growth restriction. But doing that on every patient at all the time in the pregnancy is useless. Doing it in the third trimester is not found to be very useful unless you have suspicion of a late onset IUGR. In those patients you may have to use it. Then you measure two measurements, abdo abdominal circumference or EFW at least three weeks apart. That will minimize the false positive rates of growth restriction. So you need to plot, say the values are like this and you have one observation and the second observation. If it falls like this it is normal, if it falls like this it is at top. So it will help you to pick the growth, slowing down of growth of the fetus. And in those cases, you can start doing regular fetal assessment and well as Doppler studies. Right. Now we have found a fetus who is small for gestational age. We need to identify whether they are really growth restricted or not. So we need to do certain investigations. The best investigation is actually, again, ultrasound. You need to first rule out any anatomical abnormalities as well as any evidence of congenital infections, especially if you see this growth slowing down in early fetal life, say before 32 weeks. 
generally around 20 to 26 weeks or so if the growth slowing down is noted those babies are classified as classified as early onset IUGR or early onset growth restriction which may be uh, due to a congenital infection congenital anomaly chromosomal anomaly and other cases so you may have to think about doing karyotyping a detailed anatomical survey as a less uterine artery doppler in those cases some people are suggesting doing serological uh, screening for CMV and toxoplasma if you suspect them as having CVSDA syphilis and malaria and other causes doing uterine artery doppler late in the pregnancy around third trimester are not that useful so we have identified a small baby we confirmed that with ultrasound measurements and now we are following them up with uh, various Doppler and other uh, parameters to monitor the monitoring is actually to identify the babies who are going into real hypoxia or acidemia acidemia is due to hypoxia due to increased lactic acid so to identify them and to deliver them timely so that irreversible brain damage or death is prevented we need to do it carefully so the measurements out of the measurements the first line of assault is using umbilical artery doppler it's the primary tool of surveillance tool in a small for gestational babies if at any time if your umbilical artery dopplers are normal all indices are normal you can repeat the observations in 14 days if the baby is severely growth restricted or severe SGA then you need to do more frequent umbilical artery dopplers so these are the indices which we use res resistivity index pulsatility index or SD ratios uh, you don't need to really worry about uh, details about this measurements but they are used to uh, calculate various fetal abnormalities in the blood flows and if these uh, indices are abnormal it doesn't mean that you need to deliver all this bit or this means you need to start monitoring the baby more frequently until when you see the endoscopic velocities disappear then you need to incorporate other measurements or me observations as well until that point you can easily continue the pregnancy because this baby is still doing okay so systolic diastolic ratios change now here you can see diastolic blood flow here if they are absent here the diastolic blood flow is reversed meaning in the diastole the blood is flowing from the fetus to the maternal side rather than from the maternal side that means the baby is partly oxygenated and partly deoxygenated during the diastole so it's likely to end up with hypoxia so in that situation especially in this situation we need to monitor the baby more closely using other methods the next method when you are suspecting hypoxia to a fetus is look at its heart which is cardiotopography so you do cardiotopography using not the visual estimation using a computerized analysis of the short term variation and depending on the POA various parameters are there or cutoff marks are there if short term variations are low or absent that baby is at higher risk of myocardial depression suppression and is at risk of death so if the CTG computerized CTG is abnormal you need to think about delivery then we have amniotic fluid volumes uh, amniotic fluid volume alone probably is not a good indicator but you can combine that with uh, other parameters there are two ways of assessing amniotic fluid volume a5 or vertical single vertical pool single vertical pool is good enough uh, deepest pool of the word uh, amniotic fluid can be assessed 
Then we have biophysical profile, again a time consuming method, but if you combine that with Dopplers and computerized CTGs, it will help your decision making process. But doing alone is not a useful thing. Then comes another Doppler parameter which is called the middle cerebral artery. Now we know that the baby's brain and the heart are the prime organs which the baby will try to salvage or save at any cost. So when the baby is facing hypoxia, the brain's blood vessels start dilating and getting as much blood as possible and sometimes it shuts down blood flow to unnecessary areas like gut, kidney and other places. So that is why when growth restricted babies have low LICO volumes because they don't produce urine, the renal blood flow is reduced, gut is completely cut down and all the blood is diverted to the heart and the brain. Brain blood vessels are dilated and it is shown by in, uh, big uh, changes in the blood flow of the middle cerebral artery and that can be used to predict acidosis at birth for the hypoxia of the baby. So in a normal fetus, the middle cerebral artery blood flow is like this. There's no diastolic flow. But in a and in a growth restricted baby there is some flow in the diastole. So this is the blood flow of a growth restricted baby's middle cerebral artery because it becomes changes from a normal systemic blood vessel to a eutroplacental type blood vessel to get more oxygen. So when the middle cerebral artery is also abnormal, we resort to venous blood dopplers. So all arteries are abnormal now, we need to look at the baby with venous dopplers. These are done only in cases when the baby is really small and premature, usually less than 32 weeks. After 32-34 weeks, we will not wait too long, most of the time we will. If the facilities are there, we will try to deliver the baby. But under 32 weeks, 34 weeks, we will be monitoring the baby with ductus venosus and umbilical vein dopplers. It can be used to predict hypoxia. Ductus venosus is the direct conduit between the hip, uh, maternal, the fetal heart and the umbilical vein. It passes through the liver straight away so without preventing any contamination from hepatic vein so all the oxygenated blood is directly put to the right uh, atrium and these are the normal ductus venosus these are abnormal ones this is ab absent uh, wave this is a reversed wave this a wave being absent is the most significant thing. If it is reversed, the baby is generally hypoxic and we have about 48 hours to deliver. Now we have identified, we know how to monitor them with various parameters. Can we do anything to improve their well-being? The interventions which we have are very poor. The only intervention which is of some benefit is low-dose aspirin. Usually we start it around 16 weeks or even before around 9 weeks now. Uh, you should be still doing it if the baby mother has had previous babies with small weight or if she has risk factors for a small uh, fetus. Other modifications like dietary changes, giving progesterones, calcium and bed rest, none of them are shown to be of uh, of any value in preventing a small for baby, dates baby. Smoking cessation may help to prevent a small baby. Antithrombotic therapy may be of use in high risk women. So we have babies, we may try to prevent them, but are there any inter interventions which should be used in any preterm baby when you are monitoring. There are two uh, things which have been considered. One is steroids. Obviously they will mature the lung and are beneficial in case you need to deliver them early. 
so it is one of the most important interventions which you can use to uh, help a uh, baby who delivering especially preterm bed rest not much evidence oxygenation not much evidence so they have been used in the past but nowadays we might recommend bed rest especially to reduce the vigorous activity of the mother or severe tiredness but oxygenation is not of benefit magnesium sulfate we give it mainly to make it the fetal lung protected because it has a neuroprotective effect effect especially under 34 weeks of poa if you are delivering uh, in those patients we need to consider giving magnesium sulfate right now we know how to monitor when should we deliver the optimum delivery uh, timing is generally after 32 34 weeks but it depends on the umbilical artery blood flows whether it is absent or reverse in diastolic blood flows whether the blood middle cerebral artery blood flows are abnormal or whether ductus venosus blood flows are abnormal even the ductus venosus blood doppler becomes abnormal or you try a vein umbilical vein pulsations appear you need to deliver even when the venous dopplers are normal generally if the baby is 32 weeks or 34 weeks majority of the, the guidelines and guide observations will be considered in delivery if some a fetus who has abnormal middle cerebral artery doppler you sh- uh, should be uh, considering the delivery not later than 37 weeks that means if a baby has had abnormal value but still continues to carry on generally you need to terminate that pregnancy by 37 weeks how should we deliver you if the small for dates be So if the baby's uh, umbilical artery are, uh, are absent or reverse, you need to deliver the baby by a cesarean section. If the feet, umbilical artery dopplers are normal, uh, with, or even if they are abnormal, if the endocellic velocities are present, you can induce. But emergency section rates are increased. You, if you are inducing them with prostaglandins or folic acid, uh, you need to probably continue f- continuous fetal heart rate monitoring with the concept of contractions. Folic acid is a good option for possibly small for dates babies with or without any evidence of umbilical artery. Generally, we admit these women early, wait for spontaneous labor if they are uh uh billing for a normal vaginal delivery so this slide summarizes what we do so we screen with symphysical fundal height chart we screen with history and biochemistry and uterine artery dopplers if those are abnormal we do umbilical artery dopplers uh, and if they are normal we do repeat measurements are like the middle cerebral artery and fetal biometry every second week or more and we if they are present we repeat them until delivery at 37 weeks if they are abnormal or absent or reverse in diastolic flow in those cases we go for ductus sinuosus middle cerebral computer ctg and then generally we deliver by 32 weeks or even between 30 and 32 weeks if the ductus venosus is uh, getting abnormal or computer ct is abnormal so what are the long term outcomes of these babies generally perinatal outcomes are poor in severe or extremely low birth weight babies or severe sga babies So about 20% of small for dead babies have growth below 5th centile after the delivery. So they don't do well. And they are at increased risk of uh, 
reduction in maternal fel- uh, feeling of fetal movement so they always present with reduced fetal movement so that is one point for your attention you need to consider a UGR or SGA if a woman is admitted with reduced fetal movement so all women who are admitted with even a single complaint of reduced fetal movement don't send them away li- uh, lightly after doing a CT they need full assessment with umbilical, uterine artery doppler, middle cell blood, IQ assessment and CTGs and then a consultant should see them before discharge. Any woman coming with dribbling and meconium stain like is at a higher risk. If the baby is small, they are at a higher risk of meconium stain. They have a higher risk of intrapartum CTG abnormality. They have very high risk of intrauterine fetal death. They have high risk of hypoxic ischemic and kephalopathy. They have high risk of poor neurological development. They have delays in cognitive development. They can die suddenly after delivery. And they have higher, in adult life, they are at higher risk of having type 2 diabetes and hypertension. Which catch up, catch up growth in the first few months of life may predict a healthy outcome in the adult life, but still, people doubt that. How do we uh, care for the baby after the delivery? Well, as always, when you are in trouble, call your neonatologist to rescue. They are your saviour. So treat your neonatologist with care. Thank you.